السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله الحمد لله العلي الأعلى الذي خلق فسوى والذي قدر فهدى أشهد أنه لا إله إلا هو له الأسماء الحسنى وأشهد أن محمدًا عبده ورسوله صاحب المقام المعلى أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يوم لا ينفع مال ولا بنون إلا من أتى الله بقلب سليم صدق الله العظيم Respected scholars, brothers, mothers, sisters, listeners The history of humanity has seen many great leaders, achievers and individuals who excelled in some way or the other. But there is no one person who has accomplished everything in life. Even those who accomplished great things, they themselves and others would concede that there was much more that they could do that they didn't do. At times people will say, if only he lived a little while longer, perhaps he would have accomplished some of the unaccomplished feats in his life. Further, that person who was a great achiever, he and others would acknowledge that as much as he achieved, there were still shortcomings, there were still deficiencies in his life. There is but only one exception, and that is Sayyiduna Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He achieved his entire life's mission to perfection without any blemish, deficiency, or shortcoming. There is no other human in the history of humanity who could stand up in front of thousands of Sahaba and say, Hal ballaghtu, have I fulfilled my mission? And the thousands rised in echo that, Ya Rasulullah, you have fulfilled your mission. Millions and billions thereafter pay tribute to the Nabi of Allah at his resting place. We say, Ballaghtar risala wa addayt al amana. Ya Rasulullah, you fulfilled your life's mission to perfection. Brothers, you know there's an Arabic saying, Man ahabba shay'an akthar dhikra. When you love something, then you remember it in abundance. You remember it excessively. We have our weaknesses, we have our shortcomings, but we love the Nabi of Allah. That's why we love to remember him. That's why we have gathered here today to remember the greatness of Allah's creation. I, this, I say this often in my talks. I once saw a tweet at the time of Hajj, and I've never forgotten it, and hence, I always share it. And the person tweeted in one sentence, and he said something so profound. He said, it's 1400 years since the Nabi of Allah left this world, yet he remains the most visited man on the planet. You know, I just recently returned from Umrah. And the one thing that really struck me was any person, whether they're going for the first time or they're going for the hundredth time, when, you, when, when they talk about the journey even before they left, when you meet them at the airport, when you see them on the bus as you're entering Medina, when you see them in the haram, when you see them at the rawda, when you see them return, when you meet them days after they return, they have that glow on their face radiating love for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Think about it. Those who have been privileged and blessed by Allah to stand before the Rodai Mubarak. You get all sorts of people, educated, uneducated, mannered, ill-mannered, disciplined, ill-disciplined, people from various backgrounds, different ethnicities. But you look at every face, every face, it's radiating with love. When they sing, As-salatu was-salamu alayka ya Rasulallah. This is a sign of the strength of the Ummah. With all of our weaknesses, all of our shortcomings, all of our deficiencies, we still love the Nabi of Allah. We'll spend every penny. We'll save for years, if not decades, for one visit. We'll gather, we'll congregate 
to listen, to read, to discuss, to engage about the great sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Our gathering here this afternoon is testimony to our love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa May Allah make that love a means of our salvation. May Allah make that love a means of us securing the intercession of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And may Allah make that love a means of us securing Jannatul Firdaus in his proximity. You know, one scholar, someone had returned from Umrah, so he gifted him a pair of clothes that he got from Medina, that he purchased in Medina. So the scholar picked it up and he kissed it and he hugged it. So somebody remarked, you know, Hazrat, he bought it from Medina, but it's not manufactured in Medina. It's manufactured somewhere else in the world. So the alim gave such a beautiful response. He said, I know it's not manufactured in Medina, but it has been touched by the winds of Medina. It has been touched by the winds of Medina. That same scholar, someone asked him a hypothetical that if Allah had to give you one dua that was guaranteed acceptance, what would the dua be? He said, I would say, oh Allah, that love that Sahaba had for Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, give me just a fraction of that love. That love that Sahaba had for Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, give me just a fraction of that love. Brothers, what a Nabi Allah has given us. What a privilege, what an honor, what a blessing, what a bounty, what a boon to be from the Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you look at the physical beauty of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Aisha radiallahu anha says, those women who were mesmerized by the beauty of Yusuf alayhi salam, which led them to cut their fingers, if they had to be exposed to the beauty of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, they would cut their hearts. Imam Qutubi has said the physical beauty of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam is such, Allah has not shown it to us in this dunya. Allah has not shown it even to the Sahaba in this temporary abode. Because only the eyes of the Akhirah will have the capacity to fully grasp the physical beauty of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Every aspect of his. You know, do you ever attach any value to a man's saliva? Think about it. Yet look at the saliva of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa On the occasion of Khaybar, Ali radiallahu anhu has got an eye infection. The Nabi of Allah takes his saliva and applies it. Not only is the infection cured, the scholars say that became the stronger of the two eyes of Ali radiallahu anh. Anas radiallahu anh had a well, his family had a well, the water was bitter. The Nabi of Allah takes a drop of his saliva, immerses it in the water, till today it is the sweetest water in Medina. You know, I was reading one narration of Imam Suyuti has quoted that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was one day chewing on meat. He was chewing on a piece of meat. And a group of Sahaba came to visit the Rasul of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, share with us. So the Nabi of Allah gave them another piece. They said, no, that piece, that piece. So each one took from the very piece that the Nabi of Allah was consuming. They say each one of those who consume from the very piece that the Nabi of Allah consumed, till the day they died, the fragrance of the saliva of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi was still in their mouths. At times when there was a shortage of food in the house, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi would say, Fatima, bring my grandchildren here. He would take his Mubarak saliva, put it in their mouths. They would not feel hungry till the evening. The perspiration of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as Allah says, one day the Nabi of Allah came to our house and he was perspiring. My mother brought a bottle to collect the perspiration. So the Nabi of Allah smiles and says, what do you want with my perspiration? So he says, Ya Rasulullah, we take a drop and add it to our perfume and it becomes the best of fragrances. A man comes to the Nabi of Allah and he says, Ya Rasulullah, my daughter's getting married. I got nothing to give her. Can you help me out? So the Nabi of Allah says, I've got nothing monetary to give you but come with a bottle and come with a stick. So the man comes with a bottle and a stick. The Nabi of Allah collects his perspiration. He says, give this as a gift to your daughter and tell her to use the stick to apply it as a fragrance. Imam Suyuti says, 
when this daughter would apply a drop of the Nabi of Allah's perspiration as fragrance, the entire environment would become scented in such a wonderful way that people started to term her house as the house of fragrance. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The saliva of the Nabi of Allah, the perspiration of the Nabi of Allah, the touch, the touch of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The famous story on the occasion of Hijrah. There's no food. There's drought. They come to Umm Ma'bad in the middle of the desert. The Nabi of Allah says, any food? She says, no. The Nabi of Allah sees one goat, very thin goat, only one. Can you get some milk from the goat? It's too weak. There's drought. The goat doesn't give milk. Nabi of Allah says, bring it here. He touches the udders. He touches the udders of the goat. It gives so much of milk. The Nabi of Allah drinks till he's satiated. Abu Bakr drinks till he's satiated. Then enough is left over for the family of Umm Ma'abad. But he doesn't stop there. They say this goat lived for 18 years, right into the era of Umar ibn al-Khattab. And every day they would milk it to the maximum morning and evening due to the barakah of one touch of Rasulullah sallallahu Now, if that was the physical beauty of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the external beauty of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa can we ever begin to imagine what was the internal beauty of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa That heart which received revelation. That heart upon which the Quran was revealed. That heart which engaged with Allah on the night of Mi'raj. At-tahiyyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibat. As-salamu alayka ayyuhan nabiyyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Can we even begin to imagine the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Now that is what I want to address you on today. The heart. The Nabi of Allah said, Ala inna fil jasadi mudgha. There is a piece of flesh in the body. Ida saluhat saluh al jasadu kullu. If that piece of flesh is in order, all the limbs and all the organs and every artery and every sinew of your body will be in order. But if it's in disorder, then everything else will be in disorder. Your spiritual heart, not the physical heart, because there you can do heart transplant. Your spiritual heart, it's central. Every limb, every organ, Every artery, every word, every action, every intention is either guided or misguided by your heart. Now, I want to ask myself and I want to ask you a question. As we sit here today, how clean is our hearts? How sound is our hearts? Don't judge the next man, judge yourself. Judge yourself. If today our eyes have to close and our hearts have, come to, have to come under the microscope of Allah, what would our hearts look like? A sahabi asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, who is the best from your ummah? Now just imagine, right? The Nabi of Allah is the best of Allah's creation. And he's being asked that from your ummah, who will be the best? So the Nabi of Allah said, a person with two qualities. Mahmumul qalb, saduqul lisan. A man who has a clean heart and a truthful tongue. So Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, truthful tongue we understand. Right? Don't lie, don't slander, don't gossip, don't backbite. But clean heart, what do you mean? So the Nabi of Allah mentioned a few things, and this is what I want to, un to unpack. At taqi, you must have a pious heart. An naqi, you must have a pure heart. لا إثم فيه ولا بغية. There must be no sin. There must be no transgression in your heart. ولا غل ولا حسد. There must be no jealousy, malice, animosity, and rancor. If you have these things, then you have a clean heart. You have a sound heart. So let's unpack each one of them. التقي to have a pious heart. What does it mean? It means the heart must be conscious of Allah. It means. That my, our hearts must be filled with the love of Allah Taala, 
And how do you know if your heart is filled with the love of Allah? When you worry about what Allah thinks more than what you worry about what people will think, then you must know your heart is filled with the love of Allah. Today, most of our lives is filled with worry about what others think. And in English, they say, what others think about you is none of your business. What others think about you is none of your business. We are obsessed. We are occupied with the thought of what others think of us. How occupied are we with the thought that what does Allah think of me? Brothers, as we reflect and as we introspect about the state of our hearts, again, don't judge the next man, judge yourself. And ask yourself the question, who owns my heart? Who occupies my heart? What is in my heart? Muawiyah said, Rasulullah was asked, how do you purify the heart? And the Nabi of Allah said, by making sure that at every juncture in your life, you are aware that Allah is watching you. So that's the first point of reflection that I want to share with you. That let's ask ourselves the question, to what extent does Allah occupy my heart? To what extent is my heart filled with the love of Allah? Wa ta'ala? So that's the first, at taqi The second, an naqi The heart must be pure. In your worship, it must be pure. In your interactions and dealings, it must be pure and sincere. In your admonishment and rebuke of others, your intention must also be pure. Even if you're telling someone that they are wrong, you must be telling them that they are wrong for the right reasons, in the right way, at the right time, with the right words, in the right tone. Ikhlas. So the first aspect of purity of heart is whatever you do, material or spiritual, private or public, Holy, totally, only, solely and exclusively for the pleasure of Allah. Lilla, lilla, only for Allah. The second aspect of, a, of purity, right? So we're talking about a clean heart. The first part was a taqi, pious, piety in the heart. The second, a naqi, purity. So the second part to purity after sincerity is that you must wish well for, for, wish well for others. There's a hadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, you will never reach the perfection of Iman, the essence of Iman. Until you love, for, you love for your brother, what, do you, what you love for yourself. Abdullah ibn Abbas used to say, Alhamdulillah, I have three qualities. I have three qualities. If Allah gives me insight into one verse of the Quran, I wish that all of humanity must have the same knowledge. If I hear there's a just ruler in a distant land, even though he has nothing to do with me, but my brothers are benefiting from his just rule, I'm happy for them. If it rains at a distant place, I've got no livestock there, but others are benefiting, I'm happy for them. Today, our misery is because of the happiness of others. We can't see others be happy, let alone wish for others what we wish for ourselves. And that's why our hearts are, are contaminated. There's a hadith when Rasulullah sallallahu said, يَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةَ أَقْوَامٌ Each one of us desires to enter Jannah. So here's a ticket to Jannah. The Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there are those people who will enter Jannah that their hearts أَفْئِدَتُهُمْ مِثْلُ أَفْئِدَةِ الطَّيْرِ Their hearts are like the hearts of birds. So what does it mean to have a heart like a bird? One, one interpretation scholars say, you have tawakkul and reliance on Allah. But another interpretation is birds have soft hearts. Soft hearts. To what extent are we soft in our interaction, in our dealings with one another? We are soft on ourselves, hard on others. Where we ought to be hard on ourselves and soft to others. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Your brother makes a mistake. Fatlub lahul udra. Look for an excuse for him. And if it's such a bad thing, you can't think, you can't fathom, you can't comprehend an excuse, then say, maybe there is an excuse, but I can't think about it. So you want Jannah, have a soft heart. You want to be protected from Jahannam. These are not my words. The words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The Nabi of Allah said, every such person will be protected from Jahannam. Who has which qualities? Ala kulli qareebin, hayyinin, sahlin. He remains close to people, even though when you interact with people, you're going to encounter difficulty. And he's soft and he's lenient in his interactions with people. 
In one hadith it is mentioned, Khaba Abdun wa Khasir. May that servant be destroyed in whose heart Allah wa ta'ala has not put softness, leniency, mercy, compassion. There's a famous incident, there was one Sahabi. Whenever any delicacy would come to Medina, he would like to offer it to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So one day a delicacy came, he had no money. He takes the delicacy and he presents it as a gift to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Nabi of Allah consumes it with relish. Then the merchant comes and says, hey, where's my box? He says, I don't have any box. He ate it, ask him. So the merchant comes and he says to the Nabi of Allah, that pay up. Let's pause here for a moment. Imagine somebody does this to you. They come to you and they offer you a gift and you accept it with relish. And after that, you realize that I actually have to pay for it. What did the Nabi of Allah do? He laughed. He smiled. He paid for it. He said, all right, come now that I paid for it, you join me and you enjoy it with me. The same Sahabi, it is mentioned in the narrations, he was an alcoholic. And repeatedly he would be caught for consuming alcohol and he would be whipped. And after repeating the offense, after repeating the offense, one day somebody out of frustration said, may Allah curse you. The Nabi of Allah said, no, no, no. Don't help shaitan against your brother. Don't help shaitan against your brother. This man loves Allah and he loves the Rasul of Allah. Look at the softness and the leniency that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was willing to accommodate an alcoholic. And the Nabi of Allah saw his virtue that he loves Allah and he loves the Rasul of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How did the Nabi of Allah bring Umar to Islam? Because he had a soft heart, a lenient heart. He looked beyond the animosity of Umar to the talent of Umar. Beyond the animosity of Khalid bin Walid to the talent of Khalid bin Walid. And that's how they not only became Muslims, but they became great and the greatest of Muslims. And Nabi of Allah was so easy going in Shama'il it's mentioned that in order to make people comfortable in his presence to benefit from his knowledge, the Nabi of Allah would intentionally joke around with the Sahaba. He would intentionally joke around with the Sahaba. So that's the second. And naqi have a pure heart. The first is have a pious heart. The second is have a pure heart. The third is la ithma fihi wa la There must be no sin in your heart. No intention to sin. And no action of sin because that contaminates the heart. No backbiting. No gossiping. No slandering. No tail carrying. That's a cancer that is leading you to the mother of all spiritual heart attacks. You know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in one hadith that, Oh my sahaba, don't tell me stories about others. Don't tell me stories about others. Because when I come out to meet you, I want to have a clean heart. I don't want to know what that man did and what that man said. I want to meet everyone with a clean heart. What's our condition today? Why you never tell me? I thought you would tell me. Oh, hey, did you hear? How come you don't know? We want every salacious detail. We want to believe the worst of people, not the best of people. In our books, everyone is wrong until proven right. Whereas in the Nabi of Allah's eyes, everyone is right until proven wrong. Then we forward everything that comes on our device. In the court of Allah, you can't say, Oh Allah, forwarded as received. Or retweets are not endorsements. This is a serious plague that is eating away at the moral fiber of our community. We're looking, we're investigating. The Quran tells us, Don't think too much. No, we want to overthink. Nabi Sallallahu says, La tajassasu, don't pry. We want, to, we want to be the biggest investigators of the faults of others. Whereas in one hadith, and I'm just cutting it short, I'm not giving you the wording. The Nabi of Allah said, an intelligent man is he who remains oblivious of the shortcomings of others. Walk away from quarrels and fights and you won't have sin in your heart. Remind yourself of the words of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You walk away from a quarrel and you are wrong, you get a house on the outskirts of Jannah. You walk away from a dispute and you're right, you get a house in the prime land of Jannah. Then the fourth quality of a pure heart and a sound heart, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, wala ghilla wala hasad. There's no jealousy in that heart. Anas radiallahu anhu said, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa told me, Ya Bunay, my son, live your life such a way that morning and evening you must have no jealousy towards anyone in your heart. And oh my son, if you do that, you're on my sunnah. And if you're on my sunnah, I will love you. And if I love you, you will be with me in Jannah. So this jealousy 
is not only creating havoc on earth, it's depriving us of Jannah. It's depriving us of Jannah. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has advocated that we must clean our hearts. We must polish our hearts. We must varnish our hearts. He said in the, in the heart of a Muslim, Iman and Hasad cannot exist simultaneously. We know the story of the Sahabi, but how many of us desire to become that Sahabi? He walks into the masjid, the Nabi of Allah says he's a Jannati. Abdullah ibn Amr stays with him three nights. No special ibadah. In the end, he asks him, what's your secret? He says, I have no jealousy against anyone. I have no bad feelings against anyone. I don't desire to have what Allah has blessed others with. I wish well for everyone. There is absolutely no dirt in my heart. My heart is clean. This is also sunnah. And this is a ticket to Jannah. The verse which I recited in my introduction, Allah says, on that day of Qiyamah, in the first part of my talk, brothers, I shared with you the virtues of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I spoke about our love. But in the second half, I want to share with you the serious message. The sunnah doesn't only pertain to the external, to the internal. Don't judge the next man. Don't misinterpret my words to fit your assumptions. Just let me judge myself and you judge yourself. How clean is our hearts? When the Quran tells us very categorically on the day of Qiyamah, nothing is going to help you. Except that if you come to Allah with a clean heart, with a sound heart, if you have a clean heart, you'll be happy in this world. If your heart is dirty, you'll never be happy. And if you have a clean heart, you'll be happy in the year after as well. Visualize if your heart has to be examined by Allah. Not by any human, but examined by Allah. Time is fast running. Let me share with you as I conclude a few action points. So how do we clean our hearts? I started off by mentioning that it's only Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who lived a life where he fulfilled his mission to perfection. We spoke about the physical excellence of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the saliva of the Nabi of Allah, the perspiration of the Nabi of Allah, the touch of the Nabi of Allah. But was, if that was the excellence of the external, imagine the internal. All of us would like to emulate the Nabi of Allah in the external. How we dress, how we eat, how we sleep, and that is great. It's great, we should do it. But when are we going to start emulating the internal of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? The heart, the values, the qualities. So the first thing to have a clean heart is establish a relationship with the Quran. Because the Quran is shifa'ul lima fi sudur. A, a, a heart without Quran is like a ruined house. In the words of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The second is dhikr. Alladheena amanu wa tatma'innu quloobuhum bi dhikrillah. Allah says, people who have Iman, the dhikr of Allah brings them peace and tranquility. Your heart will be calm. The third is, avoid sin. Sin darkens the heart, it blackens the heart. It corrupts your intentions, it corrupts your actions, it robs you of your peace of mind, it steals your contentment and your happiness. Allah says, if you sin, you'll never be happy, no matter what you achieve or what you have. The fourth is contemplation and reflection. And I'm stressing this over and over again. Each one of us must sit and examine the state of our own hearts. That can I present this heart of mine in the court of Allah? Life is running past. Time is running out. People are leaving us on a daily basis. When are we going to start realizing I have to present my heart to Allah wa ta'ala? Then abundance of istighfar. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has taught us that there's a covering that comes over the heart because of our daily exertions and interactions and dealings. And the only way you can remove that fog from your heart, your spiritual heart, is by an abundance of istighfar. Then a few other tips from the seerah and sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The Nabi of Allah said, if you want to remove the impurities of the heart, so mutalathati ayyamin min kulli shahr. Fast at least three days every month. Fast at least three days every month. Another advice that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa gave us, he said, if you want your heart to be soft, if you want your heart to be soft, then feed the poor and tap the head of the orphan. Feed the poor and tap the head of the orphan. The eighth advice, Rasulullah sallallahu said, لا تكثروا الكلام بغير ذكر الله Don't talk too much. If you talk, let it be a remembrance of Allah. And remembrance of Allah is not only subhanallah, alhamdulillah, meaning remind people of Allah. Remind yourself of Allah. Even in a casual way, even in a casual environment. And then the Nabi of Allah says, if you don't, 
Excessive, unnecessary speech makes your heart hard. Excessive dhikr softens your heart. A hard heart distances you from Allah. A soft heart brings you closer to Allah. Another tip, brothers, and this focus we, we're almost about to conclude, is don't have, don't have expectations in others. Don't have expectations in others, especially those closest to you. Because they will break your heart. Do only for the pleasure of Allah. If they return the favor, it's the bounty of Allah. If they don't return the favor, you know you did it for Allah. And Allah will always guarantee you the reward. You want a sound heart? You don't want to have hatred and animosity and jealousy towards other people in your heart? Then don't have expectations of others. Because humans are bound to disappoint you. And lastly, the tenth one, the advice that I share with you. Is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us many du'as for a clean heart. Allahumma ati nafsi taqwaha. Oh Allah, make my heart pious. Ya muqallib al-qulub. Thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Oh Allah, uh, establish my heart on the deen. Establish my heart into your obedience. Obedience. Qalban khashi'a, qalban dhakira. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made du'a for all of these noble qualities in the heart. If you focus on the heart then your entire life will become focused and your entire life will become disciplined and then you'll find you your, your on the pathway towards success materially as well as spiritually. Let me conclude with these thoughts. Once Rasulullah was asked a question by a Sahabi, he said, Ya Rasulullah, what is Islam? The Nabi of Allah said, Islam is that you must hand over your heart to Allah in totality and people must be safe from the evil of your hands and your tongue. Deen is not complicated. Deen is easy. Hand your heart over to Allah and ensure that people are safe from the evil of your tongue and the evil of your hands, your actions. I'll conclude with this hadith of Rasulullah and this has been the core of my focus. The Nabi of Allah says, Inna Allah ta'ala la yandru ila ajisamikum wa la ila suwarikum. This is the reality of life. Allah won't judge you by your physique or by your appearance. But Allah will look at your heart and your actions. And your actions are dependent on the state of your heart. Brothers, I've elaborated. And this is my message to you. Work towards a heart that has those qualities. A taqi, piety, a naqi, purity. La ithma fihi, that has no sin or intention or inclination to sin. La ghilla wa la hasad. And you don't have hatred and animosity and jealousy and enmity and rancor towards others. Clean your heart. Polish your heart. Varnish your heart. Allah will give you the happiness of this world as well as the happiness of the year after. May Allah grant us the inspiration from the seerah and the sunnah of Rasulullah to clean our hearts. And may Allah take us on the day when our hearts is at its cleanest. And may Allah wa ta'ala grant us Jannatul Firdaus by means of a sound heart. Wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.